it's a gamble from my perspective as being a long-term investor in positive cash flow properties. But that is what seems to be being done. And the market is defining itself based on those buyers because that's what exactly what I'm seeing is the price that a buildings, multi-units are buying and selling at. The market is tolerating this zero positive cash flow conversation in those markets. I am Christina Suter, and this is the Real Estate Breakthrough Show, where we talk about the reality of real estate, the mindset you need in order to face the reality of what it is, and tips and tricks to get you moving forward in investing. I am your host, Christina Suter. Real estate education. Every time I try to do one of these educational shows, I try to give you an understanding of why real estate education is so important. Informed decision making. Not only does it lead to better decisions, but it also leads to being able to take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of you in a whole new way. If you weren't educated in that, it also gave you greater clarity and maybe even excitement in being able to implement your real estate decisions and your real estate investments. Real estate education is key to being able to feel successful in real estate. Okay, so investing in appreciating markets. Last time I did know your pony or basically how you invest, how you do market timing in appreciating markets because appreciating markets is its own pony. It really is. It's a pony doing a sprint. You have a beginning point, you have an end point and there's a cycle that happens in that up and down. There is a distinct cycle that happens. You are investing in a cyclical market. It is not hard. Go to the St. Louis Fed, Federal Reserve. It's their acronym is F-R-E-D. If you type in FRED, F-R-E-D, and the name of the city housing chart, you will find the, the housing chart for the city that you're considering investing in. And you can see very quickly if it is a cyclical roller coaster or if it's a long, low line. Those are two different investment cycles and two different investment styles work in each one of those regions. So what works? This one is appreciating markets and what works in an appreciating market. So here's the thing about appreciating markets. Appreciating markets, what you want to understand is the nature of the appreciating market. What makes it appreciating and depreciating versus a nice, long, low, steady line that's effectively barely touched by recession effects. And there are cities out there that do that. Knoxville, Tennessee used to be one of those. St. Louis used to be one of those. Denver used to be one of those and is clearly not one of those. And Boise, Idaho used to be one of those and is now not, doesn't seem to be one of those at this moment in time, seems to be a highly appreciating market. So, but there are cities out there that are, have nice, sto steady, slow, appreciation and are barely affected by recessions. Los Angeles is not one of those. New York is not one of those. San Francisco is not one of those. So you need to understand when you're investing in these cities that you're writing the appreciation course. Okay, land values are worth more. They're worth the land underneath the house. The actual land under the house itself is worth more whether you're buying a lot or whether you're buying a single family or whether you're buying a multi-unit, the land that that improvement is sitting on is worth more. What does that mean? What it means is it's harder to make good rent. I'm sorry, that's what it boils down to. What it boils down to is, is that when you're buying that asset, you're paying as much for the land, if not more than the actual value of the improvements on the land. So when you're looking to rent it out, you will find that just the nature of that single element means that rental units are less likely to be rent positive than they are in the lower appreciating markets. Pasadena, California, city I live in. What I've noticed is that houses around my neighborhood range anywhere from 950 to 1.3, 1.4 million. Depends upon same lot, same size, right? There are some big lots down the way that are closer to San Marino. Those lots are physically bigger. Those houses start at 1.3 million and they go up from there because they have more land. More land. Did I say how important the land was when you're buying in highly appreciating cities? So the land value is higher. It means that getting positive rents is harder to get. So even though the cost of building my house per square foot might be the same as that bigger lot 
<clears throat> down the street from me, or might even be almost the same as Knoxville, Tennessee, I am going to, the, you're paying more for the land, which means you're paying more for the house, which means it's harder to get a positive price to rent ratio. Houses in my neighborhood will rent for $3,500 to $4,200 a month. It may have shifted in the last three years, but that's what it was. $3,500 to $4,200 a month for a three bedroom, two bath house, which there are lots of in this neighborhood. The, the mortgage on buying that house new at its current market value of let's say a million dollars is about $5,000 a month just to pay the mortgage. P and I, principal and interest. So if I'm gonna get 3,500 to 42 on my house that I've just purchased and I'm now paying $5,000 a month for my mortgage, am I gonna make money or am I gonna lose money every month on a rental? I'm gonna lose money. Whereas the same three bedroom, two bath house on the same amount of land in Knoxville, Tennessee, I would be able to purchase that for anywhere from 3,500 to 500,000 almost 50% less than it would cost me in Los Angeles. Do I have a better chance of getting, getting a positive price to rent ratio? Yes. Does it rent for less? Yes, it rents for less, but it rents for 2,500 to 3,500. And I bought it at three, let's say 300,000, 400,000. My 1% rule says that I want to be able to rent that house out if I bought it for 300,000 for 3,000 a month. If I want to rent it out, if I bought it at 400,000, I want to rent it out at $4,000 a month. I am much closer to having a positive price to rent ratio in Knoxville, Tennessee, when I can buy the same house, the same square footage with the same amount of land for less money. And my, even though it's cost me 50% less to purchase it there, my rents have not decreased by 50%. They've maybe decreased by 20 or 25%. I have a better chance of renting that house out in Knoxville, Tennessee at a positive price to rent ratio than I do in Los Angeles. Because literally, like I said, I buy it for 350, 400 and I can rent it out. At top of the market would be 3,500. That's my 1% rule. I bought it at 350, I wanna rent it out at 3,500. I have a good chance of making that ratio work. Pasadena, not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. So. That's the basic problem with trying to buy rental properties in high appreciating markets. So if you see that you're wanting to invest in a high appreciating market, you might wanna consider how you want to invest in that high appreciating market. What is your goal for investing? In Southern California, both in single families and in multi-units, the goal has become to be able to purchase a property that rents at a net neutral so that you're not losing too much money every month, but you're continuing to hold the property while it appreciates. Not the game I played when I was an investor. When I bought my first apartment building in Van Nuys, I got a seven cap on that building. There were multiple buildings that were available to me at a seven cap, and I was able to get a positive price to rent ratio on my Van Nuys units yeah, when I purchased them. Now, Multi-units markets has compressed um, immensely and I'm gonna to try to touch on that more a little later. So stay tuned for that. So the land value is higher, getting a positive rental is higher. Maybe rental for cash flow is not your primary goal in high appreciating markets. So what does work? Flips, flips work well. Flips actually work well in high appreciating markets. The difficulty of flips is that there's also a lot of demand. Remember, high appreciating markets are high appreciating because of the demand. People want to live in that area. So lots of people are looking to purchase in that area. So that is driving demand up for the land, not just the individual house. It's for all the land in that area. Southern California has a high draw because of our Mediterranean climate. San Francisco has a high draw because of the amount of technical industry that is up there. Um, New York has a high draw because it's New York. I don't know all the reasons why New York is such a high draw. I haven't studied it recently, but it is and has multiple and a variety of industries in New York. Washington, D.C., obviously the pull is government. So there are reasons why the demand is higher in certain primary cities than in others. 
Southern California is the Mediterranean climate that people want to be close to the beach and they want to enjoy the Southern California lifestyle. They even hold songs on this. So the land is worth more. Rentals are harder to find. Positive price to rent may share rentals are just harder to find. And you have to go further away from the city center to be able to even find that. So that's first. Second, what that means is that if there's higher demand, which is bringing more people in, which is creating more competition, it means it appreciates faster, there's more pressure, but it also means it depreciates when people get scared and retreat, which creates the downturn. They get concerned that they can't afford it, that their dollar's not working well, that they're gonna lose, lose capital, lose the appreciation they've got, and they're hurrying and hustling to sell quickly. And the fear causes a greater downturn. It's not just because the land's actually worth less. It's not because people don't all of a sudden want that house. It's because of the fear in the market. So it's both the demand is based on the joy, the downturn is based on the fear. So rentals do not work, but flipping takes advantage of the increasing demand. That's the value of flipping. So when you're able to start buying properties with the intention to rehab properties in the beginning part of the cycle, as the curve is going up and about halfway to about three quarters of the way, halfway to two thirds of the way up, you can find properties, you can change the interior of the properties and have them be worth more as long as you do a reasonable flip. Now, I can't promise every flipper they're gonna make more money. I'm just telling you the habit in the market, okay? In that last part of the market, in that last top one third, it becomes very hard to find properties at reasonable market values where there's enough space between a deferred property price and a rehab property price. I talked about this before. What's one of the indicators that you're heading towards the top of the market in an appreciating market? That new, that existing construction per square foot costs almost the same as new construction per square foot. That means demand is so high. So many people wanna live there for some reason. So many people wanna live there that they don't care if they have to put more money into it to make it as nice as the neighbor's house. They just want the house. So they'll pay as if, or almost as if it's new or rehabbed. Because some rehabs are very deep. The rehabs I've done are very deep rehabs. They're like new when I'm done because we've replaced so many of the systems, the drywall, the colors, the countertops, the fixtures, the faucets. So many things have been replaced that it is like new when I'm done with a rehab. So that same demand works for flippers, but in the last one third, that last top of one third, that's where it gets difficult for flippers to even be able to acquire properties that they can sell with enough discount in them to have enough spread between the price they've paid for it and the price per square foot of like new construction. That spread gets too tight, it's too hard to find that property and do something with the property, have enough space for construction. So what do you do? What do you do in that last third? The answer to that question is you add square footage and your profit is not gonna be in rehabbing the existing square footage. The profit's gonna be that building new square footage generally costs less per square foot than its resale value. Let me give you some numbers. In Southern California, in this Pasadena, Altadena area, La Cunada, Flint Ridge, variety of other cities around here, when the prices of existing get very close to the, to the prices of like new, when you add square footage, you can add square footage at $200 a square foot, 250, depends upon your construction, depends upon your style of construction, your finishes, blah, blah, blah. Giving you general ranges, giving you an example. You can sell it at $550, $700, $900 per square foot. So your profit is the space between the $200 or $250 a square foot that you've now put in to the new piece of construction, the extra 500 square feet you've added to it, or the extra 1,000 square feet you've added to it, and this $500, $700, $900 a square foot that that new square footage would sell for. You profit is built in $300 a square foot on the new piece of construction, $500 a square foot on the new piece of construction. So therefore, 
on the top of the market, you can't necessarily buy it at a big of a discount. So therefore adding square footage is your primary way of being able to be successful in doing a flip. Now, watch my previous video because you wanna make sure and sell your flip while you are close to the top or just hitting, just edging over. And I have strategizing and market timing on how to manage that in my previous video in investing and appreciating markets, market cycles. So that's what my suggest is flipping. Now, what about multi-units? So residentials mm, kind of don't, rentals kind of don't work. Multi, uh, uh, flipping generally works because you're looking at two forms of appreciation, the forced appreciation you've added to it and the appreciation that's occurring naturally in the market. Those two work together to make for a better flip. What about multi-units? Multi-units, they are another beast, but they still have the same problem. See, multi-units in Los Angeles or even Santa Monica, which is my favorite example. When you go to Santa Monica, which is a beachfront city, and you try to buy a multi-unit in Santa Monica, you will have the distinct effect that the land under that multi-unit is more valuable. And therefore, your cap rate or your return on rents, right, or your return on purchase, right, rents on rent, price to rent, blah, 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 that your return is going to be less. Your price to rent ratio is going to be less. So in Santa Monica, your cap rates might be 3%, 2.5%. That's a problem. You don't want to have a cap rate that is less than your interest rate. That's having the building go the wrong direction. Just keep that rule of thumb in your back pocket. Don't want to have your cap rate less than your interest rate that you're paying on your loan because that's a pretty good indicator that you'll have to pay the bank to keep your property versus gaining money from having leveraged your property. Okay, moving on. So in Santa Monica, you get a cap rate of 3%. When I was buying, you got a cap rate of 7% in Van Nuys. That is not true today anymore, by the way. We are in a um, specific effect in multi-units for the last, Oh my gosh, uh, since 2010. So in the last 11 years, multi-units have had their own compression cycle affecting them and cap rates have been compressed across all of the United States. And I can talk about that having to do with the interest rate and the com constant compression in interest rate, creating a compression in multifamily cap rates. All right, so multifamily. You can buy it in Santa Monica, but when you buy it closer, when you buy it with those lower cap rates, what's your strategy? You're buying it for the appreciation, very much the pony of appreciation. You can own it for multiple years if you want to. You can own it for decades if you want to because the prices will continue to be valuable and continue to go up. And if it's a multi-unit, hopefully you buy it towards the bottom of that cycle that it's a positive. And by the time it hits the top of that cycle, you now are not losing money on that building. That building is at least stabilizing itself so that you are no longer gonna be losing money even if rents decrease, that you're making money. So you're buying the building, understanding it's gonna be near neutral when you purchase it or slightly negative, a tolerable amount of negative when you first purchase it, counting on that once you raise rents at three to five to 8% a year, because Southern California, California rental um, rent control, California statewide rent control caps you at 8%. So as you continue to increase your rents every year, that not only are you creating appreciation in the property, but you're also creating greater cash flow, just gross income cash flow is increasing. And hopefully by the time you are hitting your next cycle where you're hitting your next round of dec decreasing rents, you are positive enough that the decreasing rents is no longer a concern. It's a, it's a game, it's a gamble. To be accurate guys, it's a gamble from my perspective as being a long-term investor in positive cash flow properties. But that is what seems to be being done. And the market is defining itself based on those buyers because that's what exactly what I'm seeing is the price that a buildings, multi-units are buying and selling at. The market is tolerating this zero positive cash flow conversation in those markets. Okay. So 
That's why multi-units continue to work even though a multi-unit is effectively a zero cash flow event or less. So I would consider that, and I have clients who have considered that, but I would I always am cautionary. If you want to do that game, and it is a game, be prepared for the building being negative for multiple years before you can get enough increase in the gross rents on the property where you can actually have a stabilized building. And I literally calculate with my clients how many years are they anticipating negative cash flow on that unit at an assumption of a 3% increase every year in rents in order to counteract your stabilized mortgage, hopefully relatively stabilized other fees having to do with insurance. Southern California, your property taxes are stabilized as well because of our Prop 13. So when you're looking at buying a building that's a multi-unit in a highly cyclical market, be aware of the compression effect on what I described on single families is also true on multi-units. Okay, so multi-units. So you hope that multi-units grow to the point where they're capable of sustaining themselves across multiple cycles because people don't generally buy multi-units for a short period of time unless they are flipping a multi-unit and you can flip a multi-unit the same way you flip a single family. And if you're flipping a multi-unit, you might buy a multi-unit at a negative cash flow. I'll tell you this much, when you're flipping a multi-unit, even if you buy it and it's a close to neutral, this is highly appreciating markets, guys. This is not the rest of the rest of the country. This is highly appreciating markets. When you buy a multi-unit and you're able to get a hold of it at a zero, zero cost net negative cash flow, Remember, that's considered a win if you can get it at zero net negative cash flow. You buy it, you then rehab the units. In the process of rehabbing the units, you will have a negative year to three years of increasing costs having to do with capital improvements, clearly, because you're upgrading the units. You will also have negative cash flow because of the amount of time of empty units that you will be facing. So you know this is a distinct project that will cost you money. This is something I would recommend for an experienced investor, not for a new investor. If you're going to be a new investor and you're going to enter into this concept of flipping a multi-unit, make sure you have an experienced mentor or partner that you're working with. Because this is literally calculating hundreds of thousands of dollars on the concept that this building will be worth so much more when I'm done because not only have I gotten appreciation because it's in a high appreciating market, I've gotten appreciation because I have improved the physicality of the property. I have gotten appreciation because I have increased rents. For every dollar of rent that you have purchased, you have increased in that unit, I believe you multiply it by the cap rate let's say your cap rate is 5%, you multiply it by 5% and that shows you, you know, divide it by 5% and that shows you the increased value in the, the um, market value of the building. So there are three forms of appreciation in an, up in an appreciating market in multi-units. There's the increased actual appreciation of the land underneath, there is the increased value of actually upgrading the buildings and the systems. And there is the increase in the value of the units or the value of the apartment building because you have increased rents. For every dollar of increased rents, you've increased the resale value of the building by the cap rate. Multiply it by the cap rate and that shows you your increase or divide it by the cap rate. Can't remember which one it is. So what works in an appreciating market? I do not suggest rentals as your primary focus especially not in the single family, in an appreciating market because of the compression on appreciating markets. I do suggest flips. If you feel that you want to do a flip and you're experienced in it, then I do suggest flips as a value, easier in the first two thirds of the market cycle, harder in the last one third, because you now have to add square footage in order for it to be valuable. And you, that requires a tighter appreciation of timing and keeping control of your timing. I had to wait 18 months to get permits on one of mine. It was no fun and it lost, cost me a lot of money and it lost me money because I had to wait so long to get my permits on my rehab. That can destroy your rehab. 
But multi-units can work, but they work under a particular philosophy, which is very different from when I started investing years ago, literally 20 years ago. Yeah, I think it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, when I invested in my first multi-unit, it was a different market. All right, one last thing I wanna in, in, include in this concept of appreciating markets, and then I will be done with appreciating markets for now. When, with the high demand on appreciating markets, the infill, the center of the city, is more likely to be more stabilized than the edges of the city. Really good example, Palmdale, Lancaster are the far edges of the LA County area. LA County has downtown LA, Pasadena, and a variety of other cities very close to it. When prices start to fall in the Southern California area, what people have a tendency to do is move from the external area further in, closer to the infill center, which stabilizes the demand for the infill center. Not only are people moving to the Pasadena, Los Angeles, Santa Monica area because they want it, we actually have individuals that are local to this market already who are looking to move further in or closer to the center of the city, which means Palmdale's Lancaster's, the further out edges of a appreciating city are the last to appreciate and the first to start to depreciate and are hit harder when it comes to depreciation, right? This, the, are hit, yeah, are hit more dramatically than the infill of the city. Like in 2009 and eight, 2008, nine and 10, when we were seeing that downturn, I think Pasadena went down by 15 to 20%, but yet the outskirts went down by close to 40%. You see, why was that the case? It wasn't because the whole city wasn't going up and down. The whole area was going up and down. It was because people from the outskirts that had to buy further out when they were having their kid and they had to buy something and they bought in Lancaster or Santa Clarita, they now had the opportunity to buy a little closer in because it was cheaper. Their wages, their, yeah, their wages, their W-2s, or their salary, we're now capable of purchasing something a little closer to the city than it was before, because the price of the property was just is just less. Okay, I hope that made sense. Appreciating markets, investing in appreciating markets, and what what actually works. This is Christina Suter with the Real Estate Breakthrough Show. We'll tune in next week for more information.